اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم یا اہل الكتاب لا تغلو فی دینکم وَلَا تَقُولُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ إِلَّا الْحَقِّ إِنَّمَا الْمَسِيحُ عِيسَ بْنُ مَرِيَمَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَكَلِمَتُهُ وَكَلِمَتُهُ وَالْقَاهَا إِلَى مَرِيَمَا وَرُوحٌ مِّنْهُ فَآمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرُسُلِهِ وَلَا تَقُولُوا سَلَاثَةٌ إِن تَهُوا قَيْرًا لَكُمْ إِنَّمَا اللَّهُ إِلَٰهٌ وَاحِدٌ سبحانه أن يكون له ولد له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وكفى بالله وكيلا In this ayat 171 of section 23 of Surah An-Nisa, the fourth Surah. Allah says, O people of the book, commit no excesses in your religion, nor say of Allah aught but truth. Jesus Christ, the son of Mary, was no more than an apostle of Allah, and his word which Allah bestowed on Mary and a spirit proceeding from him. So believe in Allah and his apostles. Say not Trinity, desist. It will be better for you. For Allah is one Allah. Glory be to him for exalted is he above having a son. To him belong all things in the heavens and on earth. And Allah is enough as a disposer of affairs. The Quranic revelation appeared six centuries after Jesus. And unlike Judaism and Christianity, which do not admit any revelation subsequent to their own, directs all Muslims to believe in the scriptures that preceded it in the same surah section 20 ayat 136 it stresses the important positions of Allah's emissaries such as Noah Abraham Moses the prophets and Jesus in the same surah in section 23 of ayat 163 then in this ayat it mentions the attributes of Jesus Christ, a son of a woman Mary, and therefore a man, giving the same description of parthenogenesis to his biological birth without a biological father as the Gospels, an apostle and a spirit from God, but not Nausbillah, God. For says Quran, God is independent of all needs and has no need of a son to manage his affairs. 
the word which is which occurs in this sura which is bestowed on mary means that he was created from god's word be kun and not as in the gospel of john or whoever wrote it surrounded by alexandrian and gnostic mysticisms the word logos in greek which is surrounded by this mysticism the quran follows on from the two revelations that preceded it but is free from contradictions and various human manipulations and provides a unique quality when examined objectively and in the light of science that is it is in complete agreement with modern scientific data madam president mr ahmed didat and ladies and gentlemen it is indeed an honor for me to welcome mr ahmed didat this evening on behalf of the daughters of islam the question arises who are the daughters of islam very briefly we have two basic aims firstly to forge unity among muslims hence our motto ittihad bainul muslimat and secondly our real mission is to acquire knowledge and to help in spreading it in every way possible it is in connection th with this that we have been holding group discussions and organizing lectures by various scholars so ladies and gentlemen in keeping with our mission of acquiring knowledge we have with us today mr ahmed didat the renowned scholar of comparative religion from south africa his debates with christian scholars are now famous and are viewed all over the world he uh, operates from durban where we, he has set up the islamic propagation center and uh, he has been awarded with the king faisal award in recognition of his services to islam so uh, now i request mr brother ahmed dida to please address the public اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل يا اهل الكتاب تعالوا الى كلمه سواء بيننا وبينكم ان لا نعبد الا الله ولا نشرك به شيئا ولا يتخذ بعضنا بعضا اربابا من دون الله فان تولوا فقولوا اشهدوا بانا مسلمون صدق الله صدق الله العظيم my dear daughters and my brothers and sons on the top it gives me great pleasure to be here with you all this afternoon to come and share with you my thoughts on some aspects of islam and i was in a quandary i was in a haze I didn't know I was thinking what shall I say what shall I say what am I going to speak and uh, as if god sent the sister who preceded me here she read the verse that I read to you just now from the holy quran and that gave me an idea that look this is the voice of god as if allah bari ta'ala is speaking through her so look speak about this and i was greatly relieved You see, it has happened that when the qari, you know, generally when our functions start, we get a qari, a good reciter, to start the our our meetings, and uh, then they call the speaker. It was for Juma prayer in my own city in Durban. The qari was called pre khutba talk. The qari was called. He recited. and then they called me says now mr dida to speak so out of what the qari was reading from the quran i repeated a verse from his recitation he was reading about on huwa allazi arsal rasulahu bil huda wa din al haq لِيُزْهِرَهُ عَلَى الدِّينِ كُلِّهِ وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ شَهِيدًا that portion of the ruku he was reading 
So I read that verse out of that full recitation. And I'm asking my audience, the sons of Islam, I said, in the past 24 hours, if any of you have heard that verse, please put up your hands. I said in the past 24 hours, it was actually in the past four minutes, the, everybody had heard. But I'm asking, I want to make it a little harder for them. I said, look, in the past 24 hours, anybody heard these words? I repeat again. And I repeated the verse again. Vamar Sallaka. And so on. And he says, please put up your hands. And one hand went up. One hand went up. In a congregation, Juma congregation, only one hand went up. And I recognized the owner of that hand. That that person knew Arabic. Because he knew Arabic, he knew what the Qari was reading. Therefore he caught and he retained, he remembered what was read in the past 24 hours. The rest of them... Muslims, all born Muslims, young and old, 99.9%. They had never heard the word in the past 24 hours. What does that mean? It meant that this was just as pure sound, music, recitation. We are listening, we say, MashaAllah, how beautifully the Qari reads. We admire his recitation. And we say, Subhanallah, Subhanallah. We praise the tone. We praise the breath control. How he, the Qari, in, for two minutes, like Qari Abdul Samad Abdul Basit, when he starts reciting, two minutes, his breath doesn't break. Carries on and on and on. If you or I were trying to compete with him, our breath would break down half a dozen times before he's finished one breath. So people exclaim, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, everybody shouts. What makes, what, it makes one to wonder, what is the Allahu Akbar about? Allah is great, about what? The breath control. The breath control, it's not the meaning, what is the man telling you? As a people, as a whole, the Muslim world, the Allah's kalam is like water on duck's back. You know, you put water on duck's back, even in the rainy season, the duck is dry. You know, it has its feathers, the water just flows off. Similarly, Allah's kalam also flows off from our backs, from our friends, from our minds. It's just the sound, the music, the rhythm. We read the Quran for sawab, 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 blessings, blessings. And wallah, I believe that we will get the sawab. But the real message that is being delivered is being lost. Therefore, we don't catch it because we don't understand the language. We don't understand what is being read. Fortunately, this afternoon, our sister also translated it. She also mentioned that it is from Surah Nisa. She also mentioned that she started from verse 171. So, it is an occasion for us that we can go home and check it up. Check up these things. Not that we distrust the speaker or my sister who was here a little while back. We're not distrusting her. But if we go home and if we can check it up, going over it once more again, she has said something. Maybe we caught something, some message of it, and some of it we didn't because we might not have been familiar with it. But if we go home and check it up in our own good time, then that knowledge become, becomes a part of us. It becomes a part of our knowledge. And then when we start sharing with others, it really becomes our property. Like this, ah, it's very good, you listen to a talk, mashallah, you know, it was well delivered, you know, well, the man was well spoken, and he was mesmerizing the people, all that kind of things can happen, but it's, it's a short-term entertainment. We're getting entertained. You do get entertained. We all get entertained. You see, by our learned people, they come along and entertain us. So, it is a very good idea to go home and check up in the Qurans at home. I take it that every Muslim has a Quran at home. But it's very difficult. 
for the non-Arab, we non-Arabs. I don't know how many Arabs are here. They might be very conversant with the Quran, I don't know. But the bulk of our people, very, very difficult. Our sister said Surah Nisa, Surah Nisa. In a Quran, a volume of this magnitude, this particular one is the translation, 1920 pages. Where will you find Surah Nisa? In the first instance, to go and check it up. Where? But if you have a translation like this one, this particular one, published on this subcontinent, this part of the world, in Lahore, it was first published in 1935, or there around, by Sheikh Muhammad Ashraf, Kashmiri Bazar, Lahore. This translation is by Abdullah Yusuf Ali. There is another one, Muhammad Ali Kadiani. This is Yusuf Ali. Abdullah Yusuf Ali. Now, in this particular translation, it has advantages which no other translation has. And the advantage here is, number one, that this is the only translation I've seen so far, which gives you a verse-by-verse -verse translation. For example, starting with Surah Fatiha, the opening chapter of seven verses, it begins. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Exactly opposite that Bismillah in Arabic, on the opposite side, you see, in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So all praise is due to Allah, the cherisher and sustainer of the worlds. Ar Rahmanir Rahim. Most gracious, most merciful. Maliki Yawmiddin. The master of the day of judgment. Iyaka Na'budu wa Iyaka Nasta'een. He says, Thee alone we worship and Thee alone we ask for help. Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim. So guide us on to the straight path. Sirat al Ladina Namta Alehim. The path of those on whom Thou hast bestowed Thy favors. Ghayr al Makhdubi Alehim wal al Not of those who earn Thine anger, nor of those who go astray. Verse by verse translation. And as you are reading, you can focus your attention more on this translation because as soon as you read Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, at the end of that ayah, that meaning, you see a number. That number tells you that there is a commentary, tafsir at the bottom. This particular one will say 19. You look at number 19 at the bottom in smaller types, gives you the tafsir, commentary. It tells you what is Rahman? It tells you what is Rahim? What is the difference between these two? And what are the relationship between the two? So the, your attention is focused on the ayah longer period of time. So you digest that knowledge. It's more easily digestible. Because the Quran, the whole Quran, is a book of revelation, Wahi. But Allah Bari Ta'ala sent this Wahi like telegrams. Actually, that's how they came to him, by telegrams. It was not like stories like, you say, you know, once upon a time, the fox and the grapes, or the wolf and the lamb, or once upon a time, there was a, a tailor in China, and he had a son called Aladdin, and no, no, Alibaba, and the forty thieves. No, nothing like that. The Quran is a very concentrated book. And Allah talks by telegrams. And everybody, it's not very easy for everybody to understand telegrams. We might be literate, we read books and all that, read newspapers, but telegram, to grasp the message of the telegram is harder. And Allah is talking by telegrams. You see, like for example, like for example, our Nabi Karim was engrossed in a discussion, in a dialogue with the Christians of Najran. It was in Medina. The Christians of Najran, outside Medina, they heard, they were Arab Christians, they heard that there is another Arab now in Medina, and he is claiming to be in communion with the Almighty. He is claiming to be a prophet. So said, let's go and cross-examine him. Let's find out what he knows. So they came to Medina, and they, they were housed in the Masjid of the Prophet, Masjid al-Nabawi, very simple structure plastered mud on the floor, mud walls, palm leaf, fiber on the roof, very simple structure. 
there were no hotels and no motels in those days. So they were housed in the masjid, they slept in the masjid, they ate in the masjid, and they had the dialogue in the masjid. And when Sunday came, our Nabi Karim وسلم, offered the masjid, they said, look, you can offer your prayers here, and he was that tolerant. But during the course of the discussion that was going on, the spokesman for the Christian poses the question, say, all right, now tell us now, among so many other things, oh Muhammad, now tell us, what is your concept of God? So our Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he doesn't start like you and I, when we haven't got a ready answer, we say, well, you see, it's like, you, you try me out during question time, and you'll see it. You see, well, you know, we are, I'm going to, everybody, everybody is fumbling for words, for thoughts, trying to gather my thoughts, and I go around the bush a little bit. Everybody goes around the bush, you know, others going around and around, beating around the bush, till he says, yes, this is the answer. Our Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he doesn't do that. He is waiting for the Almighty. He wants to know, say, look, Ya Bari Ta'ala, what shall I say? He is communing with Allah. Nobody hears him. He is pressing, so to say, his spiritual buttons, trying to contact the head computer, Filawhim Mahfuz, from the preserved tablet, the knowledge is coming. He is pressing his spiritual buttons. No buttons there. There are no buttons there, but figuratively, figuratively, so to say, he is pressing his spiritual buttons. Ya Bari Ta'ala, what shall I say? Comes the answer. Pull! Wallahu Ahad say he is Allah the one and only Allah Samad God the eternal absolute Lam Yalid Walam Yulad He begets not nor is he begotten Walam Yakun Lahu Kufuan Ahad and there's nothing like unto him. Now once I repeat that I said now what did I say? Ask people. What did I say? He said, Well, you said that there's only one Allah, one God, I say, yeah. What else? Well, he's got no father, no son. I say, yeah. What else? Can it's difficult? Because it's all concentrated stuff. It is so concentrated. And the message is so... It, it, it's so much per, 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 pervasive. It is. So much is involved in these four short verses. It's like an ocean of theology, the knowledge of God. An ocean. This th four verses. But in its concentrated form, you just read the meaning and you pass over onto something else. You lost everything. You need a commentary and this one gives it to you. Explain to you that what is one and only, when it says he does not be getting, not be cotton, to whom it is being addressed. But coming back to the surah itself, ikhlas, surah ikhlas, which is a surah of purity. We are told, and I believe, that if you read Surah Ikhlas, we say Kulhu Allah, three times, you get the sawab of reading the whole Quran. Have you heard that before? Yes. We say when we start, say Dua Fatiha. So everybody starts with Surah Fatiha, Alhamdulillah. And then we read Surah Kulhu Allah three times, the Surah Ikhlas three times. And we believe that Allah will give us the blessings as if we read the whole Quran. It's a quite an amazing thing. This Quran and encyclopedia. You read 12 lines, that's 4 times 3, 12 lines, 12 verses, 12 ayahs, and you get the value of the whole Quran in blessings. Doesn't it make one to think, what is there in it? Just 4 verses, 3 times, 4 threes are 12, and I get the blessings of the whole Quran. Why should it be so? What makes it so valuable, invaluable? It's, it's worth thinking. You see the reason. I mean, I've been thinking. I've been thinking. I haven't had the chance of asking learned men. I'm not a learned man. People, you know, make, out, make me out to be a great scholar and all that. Actually, I'm a furniture salesman. I've been talking, talking, and I talk myself into talking. Therefore, I come and stand here before you. But I have not had the good fortune of going into a university, secular or religious. The only time I go into a university now is go and talk to them. I haven't had the chance of going and getting any benefit from them from beforehand. So, just thinking about it, what makes it so valuable, invaluable? So I find 
that this surah, these four verses are the touchstone of theology. Means a testing stone of theology. Theology means the knowledge of God. Is the touchstone. If you have this touchstone, you will never go wrong. Any concept of God, any community, any religious group comes along to you and gives you a concept of God. With these four verses as a touchstone, you can either accept or reject. There is no theology on earth that can confound you if you have these four verses in front of you, if you understand its meaning. The person comes along and he says, God is two. Like in Zoroastrianism, there's a God of good and there's a God of evil. He says, Pull, tell them, who Allahu Ad, He is the one and only God that there is. He's not two. The Christians say he is in a trinity, three in one. He says, No, Pull, say, he, who Allahu Ahad, He's the one and only. They think there are millions of gods like our Hindu cousins. He says, No, say, He is the one and only God that there is. Negatives, all ideas of a plurality, two, three, or many. Out, out, out. Touchstone. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. That he does not beget and is not begotten. The Christians say that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. They say, no, lam yalid wa lam yulad. Negative is the idea. Any theology comes along, this is a touchstone. And they say, God is like this, God is like that, He's so handsome, He's like old Father Christmas, Santa Claus, sitting on some planet with His feet dangling onto the earth as His footstool, the heaven as His canopy, the loving Father in heaven. So he says, Walam yakun lahu kufuan ahad. There's nothing like unto Him that can be imagined. So anything you think or imagine is not Him. Finish. This is the touchstone. See the touchstone the jeweler uses. You ladies are familiar with jewelers. You go along, let's say your grandmother left some old jewelry and you take it to be 24 karat gold. And you want to have it remelted and into some modern design. So you go along and say, now what is this worth? My grandma's, you know, take heavy necklace. So the guy, the jeweler, he rubs a part of that jewelry onto his touchstone, his black granite, smooth black granite. He rubs on it and he has samples of other gold, 9 carat, 12 carat, 18 carat, 22 carat, 24 carat gold. That's how they value gold, how much pure it is. So he says, this coloring that on that black stone of your gold, how much yellow or goldish it is, he guesses that this is about 9 carat. So he has a 9 carat piece, so he rubs on it next to it. He says, well, this is the same as that. So he tells you, Ben, this is nine carat gold. Kachara he kachara. So he says, no, my grandma, she couldn't have kept this and got this as her wedding present, you know, nine carat gold. So you go to another jeweler. Try it sometimes. Go to another jeweler. He says, look, this is pure gold, 24 carat. 22 carat. They need to put two, two carat extra something to make it a little harder, otherwise gold is very soft, it will bend very quickly. So this is 22 carat. Says, bring it here, sister. He rubs on his touchstone and he rubs, he says, mm, this one here is nine carat. It seems like a collusion going on between all the jewelers. You know, one follower rings up all the other jewelers and says, look, there's a woman coming along. You know, in black burqa, and you know, you must tell her it's nine. You must, everybody must. No, you know it's not so. He's got a touchstone. And from that touchstone, he knows nine carat. You go to a hundred different jewelers, they tell you nine carat, nine carat, nine carat, nine carat. He's not 22 as you are imagining. So, this is the touchstone. This Surah Ikhlas is the touchstone. Whereby, therefore, Allah says, puts this value upon it is that look you read it four times three times in other words you understand what you're reading not just the rattling of three times the surah three times you read the surah that's how long does it take not even two minutes not the rattling it off gives you that value in other words you have now imbibed that standard you have got the touchstone of 
testing the knowledge of God. Whatever the guy tells you, you know to what degree of acceptability it has. Touchstone. How many carat gold it is. Touchstone. So you see, it's a very concentrated book. We need a tafsir. So this particular one gives you that. It gives you the tafsir commentary. Then this one has a very comprehensive index. Just like a dictionary. Right at the back, our sister said, this is from Surah Nisa. If you remember Nisa, Nisa means women in your honor. Allah Bari Ta'ala has revealed a chapter in his book in your honor. Surah Nisa. Chapter Nisa means women. So she said, Nisa, where are you going to find Surah Nisa in this volume? Very easy. And the N, like a dictionary, N, look for Nisa. N-I-S-A, Nisa. Oh, it tells you Nisa, chapter 4. So, chapter 4 is easy to find, because every page is numbered, chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 114. So, 4 is easy to find. So, verse number 171. Once you found chapter 4, 171 is easy to find. I had to find it there. While I was sitting there, I gave me an idea. I said, now what shall I do? I said, no, mashallah, very good. As if Allah has inspired my sister to say, look, talk about this. You see? So make my task easy. Instead of thinking, thinking they were asking me, what are you going to talk about? What? I said, look, man, I don't know. I don't know. And I was planning, planning something. But as if this was an answer to my prayer, talk about this. I said, let me talk about that. So the verse our sister began with was, there's no collusion between me and her. I don't even, if, I won't be able to recognize her in the audience. Wallah, I can guarantee you that. That if I see like this, if she comes again on the stage, I'll recognize her. But in the audience, it'll be difficult for me to go and pick her up. To say, who read it here? I don't know. So she began, Bismillah rahman rahim Waqalu, Qul, Astaghfirullah. Qul. She started with Qul. Say, oh, let me finish the first Qul. About Qul Huwallah. You see, there, when he was, our Nabi was questioned, Oh Muhammad, what is your concept of God? So I said, he pressed, so to say, his spiritual buttons. I hope you, my sisters, understand. I don't care for my brothers whether they understand or not what I'm talking about. As long as you understand it right. There were no buttons. I lost two buttons in two days. Wallah, yesterday I lost one, I was just trying to put it in and it went. This afternoon, I tried to do the same and it went. And now I don't want to take a chance with the third one. <laughs> These buttons, you see, they get lost. My brother promised me that when we go to the hotel, he'll sew it on for me. So, so he is pressing, trying to commune with Allah Baritala. Ya Baritala, what shall I say? Comes the answer, Qul, say, Huwallahu Ahad, he is Allah the one and only. If you asked him, he say, why do you say, say, he is God the one and only? Look, if you are questioned about anything, somebody asks you, what is six times six? If you have gone to school and learned your arithmetic, your, your ta multiplication tables, you say six times six, you say 36. What is 12 times 12? It's 144. You don't say, say 144. You don't say, say 36. Do you? No, because you have the answer. What is 2 times 2? What do you say? 4. You don't say, say 4. Do you? No, you don't say, say 4. You say, 4. Why is this man saying, say, he is God the one and only? Because, because he is not talking. He is not talking. The words you are hearing are from his lips. They are coming out of his mouth. But they are not his words. He is asking. He is communing. Ya Bari Ta'ala, what shall I say? Comes the answer through him. Say, he is Allah the one and only. So he says, say, he is Allah the one and only. Now you see, these are not his words. It goes to prove also that this is the wahi, it's a revelation. When you read that chapter, four verses. There is no explanation there in the Quran itself. 
the tafsirs might, the mufassirs might be able to explain what happened and what not, what I'm telling you now. But there is nothing there in the Quranic text to tell you what was going on. That Muhammad Sallallahu was in Medina and the Christian deputation had come from Najran and the Prophet housed them in the Masjid and Nabawi and you know he fed them and he looked after them and they had a discussion for three days and three nights. Nothing. And while the discussion was going on, the spokesman for the Christian poses the question and Muhammad, you know, he pressed his spiritual buttons and he got the answer and this is what he said. Hmm? It's not all there. Nothing is there. Allah starts. Pull. Oh Allahu Ahad, Allahu Samad, Lam Yalid, Walam Yulad, Walam Yakun Lahu Kufon Ahad. Side. And then back again to normal. He says, You see, now this is our concept of God on a different level. It's all Arabic, but this Arabic is something different. Like a machine gun fire. Tuck, 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 tuck. Pull. Oh Allahu Ahad, Allahu Samad, Lam Yalid, Walam Yulad, Walam Yakun Lahu Kufon. And you see, this is our concept of God. This is, I wanted to share that with you. That this is how the Quran came to him in word form. What he received, it made indelible impression on his heart and mind, uh, and he had this thing scribed by the scribes, write it down because he was an ummi, he was unlearned, unlettered, and it was preserved on palm leaf fiber, shoulder blades of animals, on skins, and kept in a chest, and in the hearts and minds of men, memorized. This is how originally the Quran was preserved for us. And this is the Quran that Muhammad ﷺ, he left for us. So coming back to the subject. Qul. Again, say. Our Nabi is commanded to say. Tell them. Who? Ya Ahlul Kitab. O people of the book. Who are the people of the book? Is it the Jews and the Christians? They are the people of the book. Meaning, they had a scripture. They had certain written books. And they claimed that they were a learned people, as against the Arabs. The Arabs were an Ummi people, an unlettered people. And an Ummi prophet was sent to them. Amazing. An Ummi prophet, one who can't read and write, comes to an Ummi people who can't read and write. And yet this is given a book that puts to shame the wisdom of the learner. I mean, it's a miracle to show you that this is not his work. This is the work of, this is Allah's kalam. He couldn't have done it. Muhammad couldn't have, no man could have done a job like this. Purely on a physical level, material level. You see, this is an encyclopedia. The Quran is an encyclopedia of 114 surahs. Given by Allah bari ta'ala to his prophet, the holy prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa We say this is a revelation, a wahi. The outsider, the enemy says, no, this is Muhammad's work. Muhammad wrote this book. But he said, look, he was an ummi. He couldn't read or write. They say, well, maybe. But wasn't he a great orator? Wasn't he a great thinker? Could he not have rehashed what he heard in his environment? from the people about the Jews and their Christians and about Jesus and about Abraham and Moses and about Yusuf alayhi salam could he not what the stories he heard rehash it in a beautiful language as a great thinker as a great orator couldn't he have done it he could have so, so you see knowing full well we know that this is not his work Allah bari ta'ala testifies to it in the holy Quran he says wama yantiku anil hawa he does not speak from his own desire. In huwa illa wahnu yuha. It is no less than an inspiration sent down to him. Allamahu shadidul kuwa. He is taught by one mighty in power. It's not his. But the enemy said this is his handiwork. It's right. For a moment, I tell you, agree with him. Agree with him for a moment. For a moment. Knowing full well that this is not his work. This is not the work of man. I said, all right. I agree with you that Muhammad wrote the book. In that case, this is a one-man job. He's got to agree. In that case, it's a one-man job. He doesn't say that Omar, Abu Bakr, and Usman, and Ali, and Muhammad, they all sat together and they, re they wrote this and rehashed it and they planned it. No, no, no. So this is one-man job. It's not his job, but since the enemy says it is his, it's right. This is his work, his handiwork. It's a one-man job. You agree? And they must agree, it's a one-man job. 
I said, let's have a look at your book. See, I forgot to put it in my bag. I would have shown it to you. The Bible. I said, you see, this is your book, the Bible. It has 73 books, that of the Roman Catholics. The Bible has 73 books inside. You know, those booklets put together to make an encyclopedia called the Bible. The, Ro the Protestant world have 66 books. It means 66 little booklets. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and on and on. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. 66. I said, those 66 books were written by 40 different authors. Right? He says, right. 40 different guys went to make this one book. This is one man's job. Purely on its physical level, just the material aspect of it. This one man puts into shade your 40 authors. The greatest writer among your 40 authors is Paul. Paul, Saint Paul. I said he wrote 14 of the 27 books of the New Testament. More than half. 14 out of 27 books were written by one man, Paul. And all the Paul's books put together is not this. It's not this amount. Not even this amount. Not even quarter inch. Thick. So says, come on, tell me now. <laughs> tell me now. Let's say on the very value that you're putting it. One man job against 40. I said, this one man puts into shade all your 40 different authors. And he's not just filling up any kind of rubbish stories, fairy tales. He's giving you the elixir of life guidance for this world and in the hereafter everything pertinent for your needs you read the other thing so many things we have no time to go into it so the address is ya halal kitab oh people of the book look they got 66 books they say this is all from god it's right you are a learned people that's how allah talks to them he humors them you are a learned people. How can you go off like that? How can you say this? How? As a learned people, Paul now says, Ya halal kitab, O people of the book. La taghlu fi dinikum. He says, do not go to extremes in your religion. Don't go to extremes in your religion. Look, we are not made to say, oh, leave us alone. We are Muslims, we are good people. We pray five times a day and we don't drink and we don't gamble and we don't dance. You know, we are very charitable people. Leave us alone. No, no, this is not Islam. You do all these things, mashallah. But there's something more than that is required from us. People who are going wrong, going off the track, uttering blasphemies, blasphemies, kufr against the prophets of God, against Allah. It is our duty to rectify them, call them to the right path. So Allah commands us to tell them, Ya Ahlul Kitab, O Jews and Christians, there, here it refers to Jews and Christians. La taghlu fi dinikum. Do not go to extremes in your religion. Aren't you interfering with them? Yes. Why don't you mind your own business? So no, this is our business. Allah has made us the torchbearers of light and learning to the world. He has appointed us as the kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat nas That you are the best of people evolved for mankind. For mankind. What makes us the best of people? Because we say we are Sayyids and Afghans and Patans and what and what not. No. You are an Arab. You are a Nigerian. What, what makes you the best of people? He gives you the qualification, the standard that makes us the best of people. It's the ta'muruna bil ma'rufi wa tanhawna anil munkar. Because you enjoin what is right and you forbid what is wrong. Wa tu'minuna billah and you believe in Allah. If these are your qualifications, then you are the best of people. Then if you are the best of people, that honor, that privilege imposes upon us certain responsibilities. And among the responsibilities is that we should share this honor with other people. And the fittest people to receive this sharing are the Jews and the Christians. Because they were already prepared to receive the message. Prophets after prophets were sent to them. I won't go into that aspect. Allah says in that verse, وَلَوْ آمَنَ أَحْلُ الْكِتَابِ لَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُمْ But if the people of the book meaning the Jews and the Christians, if they hearken to this message, it will be better for them. In other words, it will be better for you. Muslims will be better for you if they listen to this message. Minhumul mu'minuna, among them there are mu'mins, good people, faithful people, sincere people. Among them, among the Jews, there are good people. Among the Christians, there are good people. Allah says, Wa But the majority of them are perverted transgressors. 
two types of people. Good people and the guy who's rebellious wanting to put up a fight with you. Want to steal your children, calling you names, want to send you to hell. Abusing the Prophet, abusing the Quran, abusing Islam. How to approach them both? You can't discount anyone. The good man, how to approach him. And the devilish fellow, how to tackle him. But our subject, going back to our subject. لا تغلو في دينكم He said, do not go to extremes in your religion. The Jews and the Christians were going to extremes with regards to the personality of Jesus Christ, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. So, وَلَا تَقُولُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ إِلَّا الْحَقِّ And don't say anything about Allah except the truth. إِنَّمَا الْمَسِيحِ Most certainly the Messiah Isa ibn Maryama, Jesus the son of Mary, Rasulullah, is the messenger of Allah. Wa kalimatuhu, and a word proceeding from him. Al-Qaha ila Maryamu wa ruhum minhum, which he bestowed upon Mary, and a spirit proceeding from him. Fa'aminu billahi wa rusulihi. So believe in Allah and his messenger. I am requested that at 6.15 we should allow a 15 minutes break for Maghrib and as such uh, there's only in my watch there's only two minutes to go I think we can have a little extra long breath two minutes extra won't do anybody any harm this is the request made by our sister here and as such now I give you that permission for this break of 15 minutes as requested. So thank you very much. So my dear sisters and brothers, Allah commands us to tell the Jews and the Christians La taghlu fi dinikum. Do not go to extremes in your religion. The matter in which this verse was revealed about the matter was about the personality of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. See, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam was born miraculously, mojiza, without any male intervention. Allah may created him. The Jews, because they didn't want to believe in him, they insinuated that because he couldn't point to a man saying, this is my father, they created a rumor, spread a story, that a Roman soldier by the name of Panthera, they also give him a name, a fictitious thing, they just thumb sucked it out of thin air, but now they spread it, sounds more authentic when it's a Roman soldier, by the name of Panthera, he raped Mary, Maryam alayhi salam, he raped her, and this illegitimate child, was given off as the son of God. One extreme. The other extreme was of the Christians. They said that because he's got no earthly father, his father is God. And he is the only begotten son of God. Eki Allah ka jana hua beta. That's gone to another extreme. One goes to one extreme in saying that Isa is, 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 is illegitimate. Haram zada hai, astaghfirullah, maazallah, Allah me bachave is bolon se. But this is what they said, ke haram zada hai. And the other say he's God, because he's the son of God. Both going to extremes. So Allah tells us to tell them, don't go to extremes. Wala taqulu ala Allah illa al-haq. Don't say anything about Allah except the truth. With regards to Masih, Christ, innamal masihu, Isa ibn Maryama, Rasulullah. Most certainly, Masih, the son of Mary, Isa, the son of Mary, is a messenger of God. Allah ke rasul hai. Wa kalimatuhu, and a word proceeding from him, from Allah. Al-Qaha ila Maryam wa ruhum minhu. Which he bestowed upon Mary, and a spirit proceeding from him. Fa'aminu billahi wa rasulihi. So believe in Allah and his messenger, Jesus, that he is Allah's messenger. Allah ke rasul hai. That's all. 
Don't go to extremes. He is neither what the Jews say nor what the Christians say. He is a messenger of God and his mother was a virtuous woman, Nick or Ati. She was a saintly woman and she was not what the Jews say or insinuate. Now this is the duty imposed by Allah upon us to clear the atmosphere. And these verses generally we all read in the Quran we do khatmul Qurans in Ramadan especially the Muslims is very particular some say we made five, five khatams some say we made ten khatams some say we made thirty khatams khatam ke maane hote hain ke khatam kar diya kar diya we finish the Quran five times we finish it ten times we finish it thirty times khalas kar dete hain usko not knowing that the Quran is not for finishing up what did we learn? Sawab you will get. I believe in that. There's a hadith which says that every letter of the Quran when you utter, you get ten, ten, ten sawabs. Neki. When we say Alif Lam Mim, our Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, this Alif Lam Mim is not a word, there are three letters. Alif Lam Mim. So you get ten, ten, ten. This sawab hume nekiya hume mil gay. हम पढ़ते हैं बिस्मिल्लाहिर रहमानिर रहीम काउंट द लेटर्स 19 190 नहीं हूं हम लोग कहते हैं 190 सवाब मिल गया सवाब तो मिलेगा बट दिस इज बिसाइड सवाब बुक ऑफ इंस्ट्रक्शंस एंड अल्लाह इज गिविंग अस इंस्ट्रक्शंस मोस्ट स्पेशली इन द सलात एवरी वन ऑफ अस ऑट टू बी हाफिजुल कुरान एवरी मुस्लिम in other words, everything that Allah tells you, we should remember. And the best way to remember is to memorize. Everyone a hafiz. But Allah knows that we are not all capable of achieving that feat. Everyone. We are a thousand million Muslims in the world. Can every thousand million of them be hafiz al Qur'ans? It's not possible. It's not practical. So Allah bari ta'ala, He gave us a system of salat. To make up for this, that you can't be half as everyone, so five times a day, every day of the year, through the mouth of the Mu'azzin, we are being given the message. For example, in the Maghrib we made just now, if the Imam was reading these verses, what our sister read, and which I am repeating, قُلْ يَا أَحْلَ الْكِتَابِ تَعَلَوْا إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ سَوَاءٍ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ قُلْ يَا أَحْلَ الْكِتَابِ لَا تَغْلُوا فِي دِينِكُمْ وَلَا تَقُولُوا وَلَا اللَّهِ إِلَّا الْحَقِّ and on and on and on and says Allahu Akbar goes into ruku سمي الله لمن حمده Allahu Akbar goes into sujood Subhanallah Subhanallah and Allahu Akbar and again Surah Fatiha and something else he reads and again we repeat now, in the Salat, we hear again and again parts of the Quran being recited. Among them are these verses. Qul, ya ahl al-kitab, la taghlu fi dinikum. Qul, ya ahl al-kitab, ta'alaw, come. Oh, wa la taqulu salasa. Oh, lakat kafar al-lazina qalu inna Allah wa al-masih ibn Maryam. You know, to whom are these words addressed? It's not addressed to us. Allah is not talking to you or to me. When he says, Wala taqulu salasa, the Imam, Imam is saying, Wala taqulu salasa, don't say Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, mat kaho, koi kehta hai hum musalmano mein, we are a thousand million. Is there a single Muslim who says, I believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, or I believe in Allah, and Muhammad, and Jibreel, that these three are not three gods, but one God? Is there a Muslim who talk like that? No. Then who are we talking to? Who is Allah talking to? Who is the Imam talking to? He says, Wala taqulu salasa. And there's nobody saying salasa. He says, Ya ahl al-kitab, O people of the book, O Jews and Christians, ta'ala, come. I ask that there is someone in our masjid, who comes from the Jews, 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 who are you calling? You say ta'alaw. Uske maane hoote hai ke aao. Hey, kis ko bilaat hai? Suppose I came to this hall, knowing that this is Rangunwala hall, and there is to be a lecture here, and I said, let me go and rehearse practice. So I come along and get a mic and get started. There is nobody in the hall. 
And I said, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, you know, it gives me great pleasure to be here and to I'm talking away, I'm talking away to an empty hall. And somebody passing by, he said, what's going on here? The peep, he says, this guy here, this guy, that did that fellow man, you know, he's talking. To who? So we don't see anybody there. Then, figuratively, they say he's talking to the wall. He's talking to the wall. He's got his guy. He's off his rocker. He's off his head. No. If I was alone saying, Ya halal kitab, taalo, and there's nobody there, taalo, ow, ow, mere beno, bhaiyo, ow, and you have to go in here. And you hear, hear me talking like that, ow, ow, ow. Better, 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 better. What will people say? What will you say if you saw me from the door? He says, Buddha ho gaya. Iska tikhane nahi hai. What he needs is a psychiatrist. Usko le jau, kise doctor ko batao. Usko imdad kare. Yes. And our imams, they are repeating, Ya halal kitab, ta alaw, there is no halal kitab. Ya bani israel, askuru ni'mati allati anam tu alaykum. Ke uchur na fi zayel. Ye bani israel, tum ya karo. You know, the favors that Allah did unto you. Wa anni faddal tukum alal alameen. That Allah kata hai ke, all the favors that I did unto you. I chose you about all the peoples of the earth for my special favors. And there's no Bani Israel. There's no Yahudi. There's no Nasara. There is nobody there who's saying Salatha. There's nobody say that Allah has begotten a son. Allah ne beta jana. And you're reading verses condemning it. And there's nobody there. Who are you talking to? In English, this is talking to the wall. Diwal ke saath baat karta hai. Yane uska thikana nahi hai. He's mad. Are we all mad? No. You see, this is Allah's instructions given to us through the mouth of the Imam that we may go and look for these people who are saying three in one, who say that Allah has begotten a son, who say that Jesus is the illegitimate child of Mary, the other who says that Jesus is God Almighty in human form, begotten son of God. We have to find them out, search them out. That's the purpose. But it's all like water on duck's back again. Water on duck's back. Badak ke upar pani phenkte hain, to chala karta hai. You see, the whole message is lost. We are where we are. We are still the best of people. In our brotherhood, in our piety, in our sobriety, in our charities. There is not another nation on earth, a religious group that can show a candle to us to say we are better than you. We have a lot of shortcomings. We fight over little, little things, especially our menfolk. They are looking for trouble all the time. They've got so much energy that they can't see the enemy, the Jalut. It's easier to fight me. Fight me. Ke buddha ko mar sakta And this Buddha can hit this young man here. We are ever ready for a fight. Because the big Jalut, the giant of communism, I can't tackle. The Russian, I can't tackle. The Chinese, I can't tackle. The American, I can't tackle. But I can tackle my brother. Now when I'm old, I can give him blow for blow. So maybe kuch hoon, pehlwan. This is the Muslim in general. Busy, busy, busy. He's busy about the beard. Ke dhari hai ke nahi? Dhari hai to standard size hai ke nahi? Huh? Yes, yes, they're fighting. Ye nasara ka kabra pehend ke tum phirte ho? Huh? Dhari rakhi hai, mashallah, standard size. Mar mushi hai, aapne usko shave ki hai? Usko shave kiya hai? Tumare ghar wale ne. He should have trimmed it. Because our Nabi said he must trim the moustache. He didn't say shave the moustache. Keep the beard, but shave the moustache. He didn't say shave, he said trim. Busy, busy, busy. Dua Parna, I used to take a Zorse. There are wars going on in, in South Africa. Muslims, good Muslims. They're bashing each other's heads for this. Ke Dua Zorse Parni, ya I used to say. Hat uthana, ke nahi uthana. Salami karni, ke nahi karni. Shoo. <laughs> Unimaginable. Because they're not listening to instructions. Allah is saying, find these people. This is the program, this is the data material that we are supposed to put into our computer. Allah's computer given to us free. Put this in and whatever is put in is going to come out. The Americans say, garbage in, garbage out. That's a technical term for putting data material in the computer. Jo busa bhara jayega, wo busa niklega. It's natural. Whatever we are programmed with, that is the only thing that is going to come out. 
You go to an institution where they teach you salami, 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 you come out saying, talking about salami, salami, salami. The other one says, bidda, bidda, bidda. He comes out and says, bidda, bidda, bidda. Bidda, bidda, bidda. This is it. Programming. And we are programmed with these things to fight among ourselves. Instead of fighting the enemy. Allah is giving you instructions to identify your enemy. Tumare dushman ko dekho. People who are coming to steal your children. And he's giving you five times a day instructions. But as I said in the Juma, in the Masjid, Juma time, I'm asking is there anyone who heard this verse in the past 24 hours? And I'm talking about the sons of Islam. The fathers of Islam. One man. In a Juma congregation. This is how good we are. One man who knew that this verse was recited only four minutes ago and he remembered the rest it was water and duck's back. Now, how can we rectify the situation? Allah gives us instructions and nobody carries it out. So Allah tells that people like that are fasik, perverted transgressors. Allah told us that among the Jews and the Christians there are good people and the majority of them are perverted transgressors. We, we read the kalima, the shahada, but in implementing the message of Allah, we are perverted transgressors. Reason. The reason is our system of education in the first instance. System is wrong. The system of our education, the way we learn to read the Quran is wrong. It was a beautiful system we are following. It was a system for new converts. Naya Musalmano ke liye. For new converts, the system we are following is for new converts. Naya Musalmano ke liye. A person from the outside who doesn't know anything about Islam, about Arabic, anything, he becomes a Muslim. An American, Dhir Chamar, knows nothing, and he or she is converted. Now, are you going to teach that person Arabic as a language? No, because you yourself don't know Arabic as a language. How can you teach that person? So you're going to teach them, say, this is Alif, this is Ba, this is Ta, this is Tha. Mm -hmm. Learn the alphabet. Then you say, this is Alif and this is Fatha or Zabar. Alif, Zabar, A, Be, Zabar, Ba. That's how I learned when I was young on the subcontinent. Alif, Zabar, A, Be, Zabar, Ba, Te, Zabar, Ta, Se, Zabar, Sa, Jim, Zabar, Ja, He, Zabar, Ha. That's how I learned. I don't know how you people learn here in Pakistan. I haven't had the chance. Maybe you say Alif, Fatha, A, and Be, Fatha, Ba. I don't know. But that's how I learned. So, the Arabs, traders, they taught our forefathers, ancestors. Two to four hundred years ago, my people. I come from the west coast of India, a place called Surat. It's a little above Bombay. It's a small port. Arab sailors were coming along to barter the dates, the muslin cloth, the turmeric, the tamarind for our muslin cloth. And we did business. And in the process, my ancestors, the Banyas, the Gujarati Hindus, I speak Gujarati, Kemcho, Saracho, that's my language, you see. So the Banyas, Morarji Patel, same language. I mean Morarji Desai, same language. Vallabhji Bhai Patel, same language. Gujarati speaking people. We speak Gujarati. So these Arab traders, my ancestors saw that they were good people. So they said, look, we also want to become one of you. It says, very easy, give me a hand. And they gave the hand. They said, read the Shahada. So what is that? So say, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. So they said, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. So now you are Muslim. Now, you mustn't eat the pig. That's right. You mustn't eat dead animals. That's right. You mustn't eat blood. That's right. You mustn't drink alcohol. That's right. Whatever you say. Right. 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 You know, you must make salat. How? Namaz. How? So look, like this. Make wudu like this. You make salat. Wash your face. This, that, that. And make salat like this, like that. What you do? is said, look, read certain surahs. So they taught our fathers by sound. Bismillah, say Bismillah, Bismillah, maybe a hundred times. Bismillah, Hir Rahman, Hir Rahim. Bismillah, Hir Rahman, Hir Rahim. So he learned. Our ancestors, Bismillah, Hir Rahman, Hir Rahim. Alhamdu, Alhamdulillah, Hir Rabbil Alameen, and on. And a few small surahs, right, now you can join us. Anytime we come, we pray, you join us. Mashallah. We became Muslim. So what about the children? Oh, we'll leave one sailor behind, one of the workers in the ship, so we'll leave him behind, and he'll treat the children. So he taught the children. Alif, Be, T, 
fe fe jim hai khada zaf and this is allah ye alif lam jabar allah mali zabar la allah be lam zabar balla mali zabar la balla te lam zabar talla mali zabar la talla salla jalla sab sikha diya mashallah now you can read this alhamdulillah rabbil alamin ar rahman learn how to read mashallah beautiful system for new converts that was 2 to 400 years ago but my grandfather was treated as a new convert my father was treated as a new convert i was treated as a new convert my son was treated as a new convert and my grandson will be a new convert na ya musliman same system for new convert my grandchild same and my great grandchildren will still be the same amazing we never become muslims we remain new converts some of us here will be boasting hamare baap dada to hazar baras se musliman hai hazar baras se mashallah originally you know when the people came the sahabas uski hum aulad hai hum sayyid hai kya hai kya nahi mashallah but as you know the system that you are reading the quran you learning to read the quran is a system for new converts hazar baras mein tum abhi musliman nahi ban sake amazing and it occurs to nobody this is what beats me that this is an independent state the islamic state of pakistan and we have giants of the intellect giants of learning here the amount of books that people give me you know the loading i had to make a special <laughs> and accompanied baggage 45 kilos i had to send away to south africa this this, this morning 45 kilos overweight luggage i had to pay 1800 rupees to get that thing out why you are loading me up this is uncle take this you must read this very good sir with apologies to my brothers and sisters i said look uncle this is very good this we give you this how can i say no i want to be said and if a brother or sister he gives you something in good way take it it's an act of good will take it so i take it take but how much can i carry and i have to move 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 so i have to get rid of this surplus baggage and still it's coming and still it will come i say ahlan masal let me have shukran jazakallah jazakallah yes the amount of books that are written on this subcontinent in pakistan books on islam they're flooding the place types and types of books beautiful books but i said the first the awwal book allah's kalam we have it everybody who has it but it's a closed book meaning as far as the message is concerned nobody knows the message why aren't we activated to do something because we don't know the instruction we read the instruction we rattle off an instruction in a language as we don't understand like in chinese for example saying or in zulu if you are taught to read zulu you read zulu without understanding a word we at 100 million pakistanis we are all learning the quran to read the quran like a parrot like a parrot we read it and some of us beautiful elocution beautiful recitation it moves us to ecstasy and tears when you listen to the recitation but the man himself he knows not a word of what he is reading he doesn't know so we complain is he is hafiz al quran or is that iska chal to dekho this guy is a double haji aur dekho to say say you know iska bank ka warsa kha jata hai he is stealing his sister is robbing her sister of her inheritance because her husband will eat it up so he is eating it up continuous double haji namazi panch waqt ka panch to kya 10 waqt ka panch farz bhi ada karta hai aur kehta hai chaus aur ishraq and shh. five others 10 times a day the guy prays and he doesn't think twice about robbing his brother of his rights he doesn't why what makes it so hypocrites no they are good people they are sincere people but they don't allow allah bari taala to speak to them it's like a closed book and the answer to our problems this recitation this addressing talking to the world like mad people this is all like talking like mad people kehta hai imam 
he ya yuhal lazina amanu jtanibu kasira min azzan that's what he was reading for example in the salat after surah fatiha ya yuhal lazina amanu ajtanibu kasira min azzan say oh you who believe e iman walo avoid of much of suspicion as possible inna ba'da dhan ismun because in most cases suspicion is a sin wala tajassasu and do not spy upon one another wala yaqtab ba'dukum ba'da and do not backbite or slander one another ayu hibbu ahadukum an ya'kula lahma akhihi maytan say is there a single one of you koi ek bhi tumhare mein aisa hai ke jo khud ka mara hua bhai ka gosht khawe is there a single one of you who is prepared to eat the meat of his dead brother allah is asking the question if you understood ke sawal kar raha hai ke koi hai tumhare mein ek bhi aisa is there a single one of you tumhare mein koi hai ke khud ka mara hua bhai ka gosht khawe aisa hai allah is asking us through the imam koi hai and sab gunge behre nobody is answering we should all reply la 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 if in your arabic nahi 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 koi nahi hai hamare mein but no in the system allah gave us we can't interject the imam you have to listen so allah bari taala poses the question and he himself gives the answer because he knows you can't answer he doesn't want you to open your mouth so he poses the question is there a single one of you who is prepared to eat the meat of his dead brother he says fakarih tu muhu nahi tumhe karahat hogi ne you will abhor it you wouldn't like it even cannibals don't do that cannibals people who eat other human beings even they don't don't do that they love your meat my meat but not his brother's meat and his brother who is dead carrion even cannibals don't do that what taqullah says of fear allah stop it inna allah huwa tawwabur rahim even now allah is of forgiving most merciful jo ho gaya so ho gaya don't do it anymore as soon as we come out we say mashallah you know imam sahab kaisa chaparte the lovely voice is god you know he can read through his nose naak mein se padta hai naak mein se is this when i was young you know people were praising people who had the defect in the nose they can't read clear they say auzu billahi minash shaitani rajeem so that thing is a great feat ah oh, mashallah naak mein se padta hai naak mein se awaaz nikalta hai <laughs> to what extent we go foolishness is ke naak mein se awaaz nikal raha hai mashallah yes we praise all that what is he saying is what on duck's back so as soon as he come out he says you know uh, the imam you know he delivered a very good like, yes but you know he smoked so many cigarettes is that what you're talking about you know but you see the imam you know he's 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 it a wahabi hai is ka to lambe kaan hai you know lambe kaan means he belongs to another school you see endlessly backbiting slandering eating our dead brother's meat because the brother is not there to defend himself that's like he's a dead brother we are eating our dead brother's meat all the time and dead sister's meat all the time and we have developed a created a taste for it like we chilies chilies mirchi khate hain mirchi ka chutney yes is unnatural but we love it i love it too you know when the thing is no mirchi inside the insipid usme koi swad nahi hai i want a little kick but you give the little child little mirchi the child will die is not is not natural mirchi khana natural nahi hai but we cultivate a taste for it chutney chataka usme hal you know what you do and to enslave your husband you know what what you do so we have cultivated a taste for eating our dead brother's meat our dead sister's meat because when allah is talking to us nobody is hearing we are only hear the sound the rhythm the music of what is being read not the message why are we listening to the message because the system the system that was given to us created for us was a system for new converts and we have not yet become muslims ke hum musliman hain so when allah is talking to us we must understand what he is telling us but no nobody cares and the irony is that the learned men of pakistan i just can't understand the learned men in south africa i'm trying to talk to as if is i'm talking to deaf ears nobody listens 
I said, look, this system, tell me now what's wrong. There's something wrong with me. I'm telling you this system is a beautiful system for new converts. Not for me, not for my child. He's listening. He won't answer. But he carries on. Still, like a donkey. He's, he's not listening. He's carrying on. He listens to you, but he carries on. I don't know you, my daughters of Islam. Those people there, the men on the top there, I tell you, I, I, I see no hope in them. I say no hope in them. Wallah, look, they have been leading the community, the nation. They established Pakistan, they made sacrifices. But there's something wrong in their thinking. They are enslaved in their mentality to the alims. And the alim, he doesn't want you to become learned. Because as soon as you are a little more learned, you'll be asking questions. And we don't like people asking us questions. It makes me to think. You know, you pose me questions. Problems, that means you're creating problems for me. Now, to find my way out is not pleasant. I don't want to bluff you, but at the same time I want to appear that I'm knowledgeable. I know what I'm talking about. So, every time a question is thrown at me, it's making me to think. And there's a saying that if you want to make a person to hate you, make him think. This is one of the hardest of things, making a person to think. If you ask a man to dig a half acre of land, I tell you that thing, mar, mar, his paper to turn the soil upside down, upside down, he can do it. No worry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But you create one little problem for him, he goes berserk, he wants to fight. Don't make him think. But I hope and I pray that my daughters are not of that nature. You will be able, inshallah, you know, you do a little thinking and say, look, something has gone wrong and you can change the men men forget home you can as i was quoting yesterday i don't know when i was quoting to somebody that women can do anything the french man says the french man says women can do anything because they govern those who govern everything they will uh, look my house my wife i am the boss you know she's so frail my wife if you see her, we are married for about 40 years now. She's still the same. She hasn't lost a pound of weight and she hasn't gained a pound. 40 years. If you look at her, as compared to me, if I blow hard, she can blow away. That's what you think. She's tough. She's a farmer's daughter. So she has been working hard. But from the looks, you might be tempted. <laughs> Don't make a mistake. But she's ruling, wallah, she's ruling. She, without her sympathy and kind permission, I couldn't be here. I can't be, I can't leave her without her cooperation. She says, go, I go. Of course, when I go back, I try to make up for it, you know. I'm her slave. I do everything to appease her. That, you know, she's happy, happy, happy. So I can get another break. So I tell you now, say, look, they're calling me now, I ain't, you know. Yes. Then she says, all right, yeah, go. See, actually she's ruling. She's ruling. Anything, everything. In the house, what she wants, she gets it. What she wants to cook, she cooks. I said, look at this like that. I said, this is all right. You take it. You eat it. It's good for you. Look, this is so. You have the art. Allah has given us, you know. You don't have to fight with physical strength, no. But with the tongue, with persuasion, with softness, you can rule the man. And there's so many ways of captivating him and enslaving him. And one way is through the stomach. Through the stomach. You see, I read a book. I have a second hand book I came across. The title of the book was Feed the Brute. Usku brute and janavar ko khilao. It says nice, nice recipes, you know. That book gave nice, nice, beautiful recipes. In other words, now. Nice, give him good, good things. You know, halwa. Once you do that, he won't be wanting to run to the hotels, eating in the streets, you know. No, no, no. Enslave him. And he can be enslaved. This is his nature. Allah made us, you know. We are strong. We just give him, oh yes, you are the boss. But, as the saying goes, you know, I think Shakespeare said it. She stoops to conquer. She stoops to conquer. She humbles herself and he said, Lord, what shall we do? So I said, all right, 
I tell my wife, where you want to go? You want to go to my relations or your relations? You tell me. See, she's her relations. I'm nearer my cities where I was situated, nearer to my people. But every time I'm going to her people, why? I want to make her happy because she's making me happy. She's actually enslaved me, but I'm the boss. The whole world thinks I'm the boss. <laughs> so, with these few words, I'm very, very grateful for this opportunity. And um, I hope that uh, at question time, you don't ask me uh, such embarrassing questions that, you know, I might feel, you know, uncomfortable. With these words, I say, Jazakallah for this opportunity. And I look forward to further opportunities of talking and sharing with you my thoughts. Jazakallah with that. Ladies and gentlemen, now we are not, sorry, ladies, you are allowed to ask questions. Uh, we have a mic here in the center and every person is allowed to ask only one question at a time. You will ask the question and then go back to your seat before you are answered. This is, uh, if the gents uh, want to ask a question, they are allowed to write down the question, give it to one of our volunteers and send it down. Uh, I, uh, my name is Asha Pandit, but I am a Muslim even though my surname is Pandit. Uh, what I wanted to ask was that I study in, uh, in the St. Joseph College and it's, uh, many Christians are there. Uh, when I ask them, wh why do you believe in this trinity, they say that uh, suppose you take three drops of water and you just combine them together, they become one. I don't know how to answer back to them. So what should I say to them? For water? No, no, no. This father is different, son in the mind is different, and the Holy Ghost is different, whatever it is. But it's different, different, different pictures. In the name of the father and the son, or uska beta, and the Holy Ghost, Ruhul Quds, whatever it is. So there are three distinct mental pictures. In the mind, when you say with your mouth, in the mind, they are creating different images. When I say, in the name of the Father, I'm asking him, are you thinking of the Son? No. When you say, and the Son, do you think of the Holy Ghost? He says, no. So I said, can you see now? Unless you are a disease, a lunatic. He's thinking of the Father, but he's thinking of his Son. So when he's a Father, he's thinking of the Son. He's, he's taking the name of his wife, but he's thinking his daughter is his wife. No. So... His mother is different, his wife is different, his daughter is different. You can't mix up. When you say father, mother, wife, daughter, three, they're all females, no doubt. But they are distinct, different things. So, where is this unity? In your mind, I say, you got three. He says, no. You see, the person, somehow or other, he's got to, because if he says yes, it implies that he's worshipping three gods. So he says, no, he's got only one. I said, do me a favor. See, I did it. You see, I am a guide to the mosque in the Juma Masjid Derb. Guide. When tourists, visitors come, I take them around. I explain to them what goes on. And I answer the questions. So there was a European, South African, European, an Africana, the people who are ruling us with his wife and children. They came during the school holidays to look at the mosque. So as I explained everything about taking off the shoes, making wudu, how we make salat, then question, they ask question. He said, this God of yours, this Allah, what does he look like? Because we see nothing there. I see some calligraphy there, some calligraphy there, but there's no picture, no image, no statue, nothing. And there's nothing in the mosque, in the masjid. What does this Allah of yours look like? I says, no, we have no mental pictures. We don't visualize God. When we stand up for prayer, we pray like this. As our Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Ka'anna katarahu. When you stand before him, you stand as if thou seest him. Though you see him not, he sees you. I said, that is the nearest we come into our relationship with him, approximation to him. We do not think of him in any form, shape or size. Laisa kamislihi shay. 
there is nothing is like the likeness of him that can be imagined he says no you must have a certain mental picture so that gave me an idea I said yes, maybe you have I said when you pray how do you pray and I answered for him see I am posing the question when you pray how do you pray I said you pray like this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost right he said right I said when you say in the name of the Father you are thinking of old Father Christmas sitting on some planet with his feet dangling onto the earth at his footstool and the heaven is his canopy and this I'm all biblical from the Bible all this thing I'm quoting I'm only taking from their language the wordings are all from there the heaven is his canopy the earth is his footstool the heaven millions and millions of times bigger than, than man but something like a man when you say God the Son I said what are you thinking of a prize bull or a false wagon no nothing like that I say handsome young man blonde hair blue eyes handsome features blue eyes like what you saw in the king of kings I'm telling him this is a film called king of kings Jesus day of triumph Jesus Jesus of Nazareth Jesus you see films they have seen these films so you think of him in one of these Jeffrey Hunter was acting Jeffrey Hunter you see with blonde hair blue eyes you know handsome features straight nose not with the poly nose you know get the popati not not with that a straight nose like a German or like a Norwegian or a Swede or an Englishman not like a Jew with a hooked nose you, see? you know what Jesus looks like then when you say and the Holy Ghost I said what are you thinking of I said the Holy Ghost you read in the book something that came like a dove like Kabutar from heaven in the shape of a dove and when Jesus was baptized in the river Jordan by John the Baptist or something something that came in flames of fire at Pentecost I said the picture is not very vivid but the picture is there I said you have three distinct mental pictures the father is different the son is different and the Holy Ghost is different he says no see if the man is trying to be impossible he can he says no I said look do me a favor please close your eyes and when I say in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost honestly I want you to tell me how many mental pictures you have so when I pose the question the children school children who were with him with the family mother father and mother they had school children so the children thought they had the answer it's so clear so vivid I said in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost I said how many mental pictures have you, have you got so the children they said all together three and the mosque revibrated echoed you see because it was empty at the time three and if looks could kill they all would have been dead because the parents didn't want to hear such words coming out from the children's mouth and this was all God sent so I'm telling them I said look you know what Jesus said he said, except ye be as one of these little ones, ye shall not enter the kingdom of God. I said, what did he want you to be as silly as they are sometimes? As naughty as they are sometimes? No. Jesus said, you must be as simple and as sincere as they are. If the child sees three pictures, he'll tell you he sees three pictures. He's not afraid that he will get caught out or what or what not. He's honest. So, I said, you see now the child can see, but you can't because you don't want to admit so it's a sickness Allah tells us in clear cut language in the Quran Wala taqulu thalasa. don't say trinity intahu khair lakum this is stop it it will be better for you innam allahu ilahu wahid for your Allah is one Allah is not three in one and is not one in three and Jesus never thought this it's not in his book the word trinity is not to be found in the Bible the whole encyclopedia of 66 books the word trinity is not there amazing thing the fundamental of their faith that word itself is not there but I said you know what that word is in the Quran amazing the religion that says no trinity the word trinity is in the Quran but the trinity is not in the Bible but in the Quran it says Wala taqulu thalasa. don't say trinity but the word trinity is there in the Quran the Bible even hasn't got that I hope you know you get some of these tapes of mine and uh, it's continuously these things are going on you know with the Christians coming along and posing questions and we are answering you can learn something there was at one time one of my meetings I went to the Cape province 
In South Africa, there are, we have four provinces. Like Pakistan has four provinces. We have four provinces. So I was in one of these provinces and I was lecturing at a place called Weinberg Town Hall in the Cape. And at question time, one white man, he came up questioning and he was asking deep searching questions. And every question I answered, he used that to develop another question. That answer, he developed another question. And from this questioning, I realized that he is no ordinary person. It's not easy that from an answer you develop a question, from the answer again you develop another question. So I, I whispered to the chairman, said, please ask the gentleman who he is. We'd like to know that he's asking such deep and searching questions. So the chairman asked and he said, I'm Professor van der Merwe from the University of Stellenbosch, the, head, uh, the headquarters of this Dutch Reformed Church institution, and I'm the professor of theology. Now we know his work, you see, he's a great man, big man, the biggest man in the Stellenbosch University on theology. And after a few questions, a colored gentleman, colored is a mixture between black and white. You know, like you have Anglo-Indians, you call them here, you know, a mixture between the Asiatic and the European, you call him Anglo-Indian. They, African and white mixture, we call it colored. So there was a colored priest, he came up, he says, Mr. Didat, you people don't believe in the Holy Trinity, but what have you to say about the first epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7, where it says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. It was, it's there in his book. He said, what about this? It's there in my Bible. Fortunately, Professor Fandamova was there. So I got up to answer. I said, look, we are very, very fortunate that Professor Fandamova is here with us today. So whatever I'm going to tell you, I'm not pulling a fast one on you. The professor will confirm whether I'm speaking the truth or not. I said, Professor, you see the verse he has quoted for the first epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7. This is in the Roman Catholic version of the Bible. He said, yes. It is in the authorized King James of the version of the Bible. He said, yes. But as it is now taken out from all modern translation as a fabrication. As a fabrication, as an interpolation, as an adulteration. is thrown out. It's not there anymore. Is it true? He said, yes. I said, you see, the reason is that this trinity, in the ancient manuscript, this verse was not there. But a certain vigilance of Thapsus in the 6th century, in his manuscript he made a marginal note for his own edification. A marginal note in his own handwriting. But when they gave these manuscripts for reproduction, the marginal note became a part of the text. The word of a vigilance of Thap Thapsus, not the word of God, not the word of John, who's supposed to have written this, this epistle. So now your learned men realize that this is a fabrication, it's an interpolation and they threw it out. Is it true? He said, yes. He says, thank you very much. So you see, now it depends now upon the type of knowledge, understanding this person you are talking to has. At times, you are talking to the wall. But even then, you can crack his skull, you know, with a few facts. Inshallah. Any other questions? My name is Nuvera. I want to ask one question. We believe that the word of God um, delivered to Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alaihi wasallam to Hazrat uh, Jibrail alaihi salam. But how were the words were delivered to Hazrat Isa and Hazrat Musa alaihi salam to the same person? I mean, Farishta or who? I think. I was confused, sir. So I, I wanted to ask this. I think what I understand is this: that you'd like to know. Yes that the revelation, the wahi, given to our Nabi Karim yes. sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through Jibreel alayhi sallam was given in word form. Yes. And how was it given to Hazrat Isa alayhi sallam and Musa alayhi sallam? Exactly, yes. Right. Is that the question? See, we have no definite knowledge about how Hazrat Musa alayhi sallam and Hazrat Isa alayhi sallam were inspired. Whether they had thoughts, ideas were being put into the mind, which they articulated, or whether it was given in word form. 
But whatever it was, the one thing we know that whatever is attributed to Hazrat Musa alayhi salam is not a first hand wording. In other words, that Allah told me to tell you. It's not like that. It is in the third person, somebody else writing that the Lord, God Almighty, said unto Moses and Moses said unto the Lord. There's a different, on a different level. It's not Allah talking, it's not Musa alayhi salam talking. Same thing to Jesus. Nowhere does Jesus say the Lord said unto me, even as the records as they preserve it, the very first experience we hear that when Jesus was being baptized in the river Jordan, according to the holy scripture of the Christians, a voice from her was heard from heaven saying, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. So they say, a voice was heard from heaven. So he was not even talking to Jesus. Yes? He's not saying, you are my son and I'm well pleased with you. Hmm? He said, this is my, telling somebody else like, telling you people, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. So it's again in the third person. Jesus is not talking. And of course nobody heard God talking about this. So it's on a different level altogether. Our Nabi Karim, every word in the Quran was given verbally. Like, Qul hu wallahu ahad. Or the first revelation. Iqra. Iqra means read. We know that it was the 27th of the month of Ramadan. He was about 40 years old, our Nabi Karim. He was in a cave some three months south of the city of Mecca, north of the city of Mecca, Ghar Hira, subsequently known as Jabal An-Nur, and the angel of God comes and tells him in his mother tongue, Iqra, read, Paho. And he being unlearned, he says, Ma anabi qari'in. He said, I'm not learned. So the angel of God commands him a second time, Iqra, read, and again he pleads. He says, Ma anabi qari'in. For the third time, the angel of God says, Iqra, bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq. So now he grasps, our Nabi, he grasps that what he was required to do was to repeat. Because this Arabic word Iqra means to read, to recite, to rehearse, to repeat. So he repeated the words. Iqra, bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq. So read in the name of the Lord and Jerisha who created. So our Nabi said, Iqra, bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq. The angel said, Khalaq al insana min alak. So he who created man from a mere clot of congealed blood. So our Nabi said, Khalaq al insana min alak. So ikra wa rabbuk al akram. So read, and the Lord is most bountiful. So our Nabi said, ikra wa rabbuk al akram. So Allah allama bil kalam. So he who taught the use of the pen. So he says, Allah allama bil kalam. So allama al insana ma'alam ya'lam. So taught man that which he knew not. So he says, allama al insana ma'alam ya'lam. As soon as the angel departed, our Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, terrified, searching all over, he runs home to his dear wife, Ummul Mu'minin Khadijatul Kubra, and he says, cover me up, cover me up. And you know the whole story. But now you open the Quran, these five verses are the beginning of Surah Al-Alaq, chapter 96 in the Quran. Surah Al-Alaq means the clot. You don't find there that he was in a cave, some three miles north of the city of Makkah. You don't find there it was the 27th of the month of Ramadan and that he was about 40 years old. You don't find there that he saw the angel and he was terrified and that the angel commanded him Iqra and he said Ma'ana biqarin and the angel says again Iqra and he says Ma'ana biqarin and he says again Iqra bismillah rabbi. Nothing there. The only thing is Allah's kalam, what was given is there. All the other things are details that we learn from history, from tradition, from what the Nabi said and what we have got recorded. So you see, the Qur'an is preserved on a unique level. Only Allah's kalam, the kul hu wallahu ahad I was speaking about. You won't find there that our Nabi was in, uh, in Medina, in the masjid, and the Christians had come, and they were arguing and debating. And all the details I gave you is from traditions, from history. It is not in the Qur'an. The Qur'an only says, kul hu wallahu ahad, Allah samad, lam yalid, wa lam yulad, wa lam yakullu. That's all. So this is what the words that were given to him, that is what we have preserved. The other scriptures, they haven't got any such thing. Even materially, there is no such thing available. Yeah. Doubt some weaknesses in the educational system. You never made any recommendations or for rectification of such a system. And that is the way we've been taught. But now, in the absence of such a system, what do you suggest is a way we learn to imbibe and absorb deen in the most effective way possible? The Quran. Yes. yes. 
I think if I, I, I think I understood it correctly that in the absence of that system, our system is wrong, we admit. The system of teaching Arabic is wrong. Now in the absence of that system, what is the second best? You see, if we can understand Allah's Kalam direct, there is no better way. Direct means if you can understand the Arabic. When Allah is talking to us, we understand in the language that Allah is talking. There's nothing, no substitute for that. But the second best is a translation. The second best is a translation. If you understand Urdu better than any other language, get the Urdu translation. If you understand Sindhi better than any other language, get a Sindhi translation. If you understand Gujarati better than any other language, I say get a Gujarati translation. Whatever language you understand best, get a translation in that language. That is second best. But you, my child, you speak English so beautifully. For you, despite, maybe you understand Urdu better than that even. Get an Urdu translation, but an English translation is imperative. It will improve your English, this translation then everything on your fingertips and the language, the terminology, you'll get the right terminology to speak to others. You see, at times we understand, I'm telling the Arabs, the Arabs, I said, look, you don't need a translation. That's your mother tongue. But if you aspire to talk, to share with a non-Muslim who's English speaking, then you won't have the right terms. So I said, look, what you do, you also need a translation. So you read from the Quran, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, in the name of Allah most gracious, most merciful. I say, Wa is qalatil malaikatu ya Maryamu. Now you understand. I say, you understand what it means. I'm telling the Arab. But now how are you going to explain to the fellow? So you start using your own words. It says, you see, uh, the, the angel said to Mary, so O Mary, Inna Allah astafaki wa taharaki wa astafaki ala nisa al-alameen. So he said, you see Allah, you know, he likes her very much. He is choosing her. And you're talking like that. It appears that Allah is talking like that. So if you have a translation, you learn the translation as, Wa is qalatil malaikatu ya Maryamu. So behold, the angel said, O Mary, Inna Allah astafaki wa taharaki wa astafaki ala nisa al-alameen. That God Almighty has chosen thee and purified thee, chosen thee above the women of all nations. Now when you learn like that, you're using the right terms. Now this using of the correct terms will improve your vocabulary, will improve your construction of sentences. And I'm telling people, our people, I said, look, you don't have to read Shakespeare or Milton to improve your English even. This book will do the job. You know, what, what things it will do for you. Allah's Kalam is there, verse by verse translation. If you read so many times, passively, you'll be understanding Arabic, even if you didn't learn Arabic as a language. You know, the way I'm reading, I seem to understand what I'm reading. You, you notice that I seem to understand what I'm reading. How did I get it? I didn't learn Arabic. It's the translation. Because using the translation side by side with the verses, Kri. You want to see? Yes. Oh, yes. This translation, I'm sure, I didn't have the time to make sure, but this was printed in, in Lahore. It is, it is available by Abdullah Yusuf Ali. The language as if it's inspired, the English, even the English seems to be inspired. This man, Abdullah Yusuf Ali, when the Westerner, when he reads it, he can't believe that an Oriental could have written that English even. The English is superb and is a substance also. This is the only translation, the English speaking person, if he starts sitting alone and starts reading, tears will start rolling down his eyes. Tears, because it's coming from the heart. You know, as our shair says, Dil se jo baat nikalti hai, asar rakti hai, par nahi taakate parwaz magar rakti hai. It's coming from the heart. So it moves people's hearts. Other people, they write from the head. Beautiful ideas. So it tickles the brain. Very nice. Beautiful. But it doesn't move you. This one moves you. Get it. And it's cheap. Allah is very cheap. Yes, my sister. And about the recommendations for the uh, rectification of the educational system. I didn't understand. For recommendations for the improvement of the existing educational system. The idea is that we must start learning language Arabic as we learn other languages. How do you learn other languages? See, when I went to school, direct method, I didn't know English. I was born in India. I go to South Africa. I go to school. So they start teaching me BAT bat, CAT cat, MAT mat, RAT rat. So I understand what is bat, what is rat, what is mat, what is cat. 
immediately I know what they're talking about. I see a kitty, I see a ball. I understand. I see a kitty ki billi dekhta hoon, main ball dekhta hoon. I understand. But here I read the whole Quran, the Hafiz al Quran, the Qari, he recites, rattles it up, and he doesn't understand one word. So the system is the system you should use for any language. Why Arabic you make it separate, different? And this is the reason. Why should it be a unique disgraceful language to learn? It's a unique disgrace. Only language on earth that we learn without understanding a word. There's no other language on earth. You want to learn Zulu from the word go, you understand every word. You want to learn French from the word go at school, you'll understand every word that you're reading. This is the only language, Allah's Kalam, the whole book you rattle it off and you don't understand a word. Unique disgrace. I say, it's about time that you spoke to your father and said, look, daddy, do something about it. Go and talk to the Mulvies, you know, to change the system. Thank you. My name is Safiya Khairi. I would like, like to ask a question uh, on your speech. When you were speaking about the Prophet being an Ummi, you said the people of uh, Arabia were Ummis too. Uh, maybe I didn't understand it very well, but as, as far as back as I can think, I read that during that time, you know, there used to be a bazaar called Ukhas in the Kaaba, where they used to come with their best verses, and they were very versatile. As a matter of fact, most of the, um, you know, Quraysh sheikhs, chiefs, were all very learned people as such. So I, I was just wondering if you could explain what you meant by that. I will. The Arabs were an Ummi people, meaning as a people they were illiterate. They didn't know how to read or write. At the time of our Nabi, there were only about half a dozen people in the whole of Arabia who could read and write. Among them was Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl was one of those. With regards to poetry, you don't have to read or write to speak poetry. You know, it's your mother tongue. And they're talking and talking and talking and they say we are an eloquent people. They were very eloquent. See, Arab means eloquent. Ajam means dumb. They said we are the Arabs, we are the eloquent people and the rest of the world is Ajam. Ajam means dumb compared to us. We can in our language, the Arab boasted, can give you a hundred different words for a sword. Talwar ke liye. Hundred different synonyms. We can give you a hundred different synonyms for a horse. How many can you give in your language? Any other language group? The guy says half a dozen. He said, you see, compared to us, you are dumb. So a person who knows his language, he's got ideas, he can rattle it off. Beautiful verses. You don't have to read or write. The people as a nation, they were illiterate. Like we would say Pakistan. This morning I'm reading the newspaper that only 5% of our women folk are literate. Overall, there's a 26% of the Pakistanis are literate. So says, this nation is an illiterate nation. Our women folk as a whole are illiterate. But he said, look, we daughters of Islam, we are 100%, you know, we are, we are literate. I said, mashallah. But when I say Pakistani women as a whole are illiterate, I'm speaking the truth. Although the daughters of Islam, 100% literacy. Now you see, this is a little fragment from somewhere. He said, now look, alhamdulillah, you are all literate. But when we are talking about Pakistan, we are thinking of the whole nation, our peasants, our workers and everything. But in end, he said, only 5% of women folk are literate. That's this morning's paper, in the dawn. I read it, somebody made some mention, you see. So that's how we talk. The nation as a whole, an ummi people, and our nabi, an ummi prophet. One, and that's how the, the, the Jews and the Christians, they look down upon them. They say, you illiterate people, you barbarians. Therefore, Allah Bari Tala is flattering them. Say, all right, all right, you Ahlul Kitab, oh people with the scripture. Come, come now. Ta'ala, come. Can you see now? This is not because they're boasting as against the Arabs. We are learned, you are jahil log. Ummi, they all right. Learned people, out. I'm bad karenge. So as a people as a whole, they were illiterate. Uh, sir, being a student of St. Joseph's College, I just wanted to ask a simple question. It's very simple. That's it, that in our college, though it's nationalized now, but still on the top of the building and in certain rooms, in which we have uh, classes and sometimes classes of Islamiyat even, uh, there's the sign of Trinity, the cross, tongue on the walls. So does it make any difference being Muslims? Should we do anything about it or? 
You see, the Muslim themselves have become so emasculated. The Muslims, we are, we are, you see, you go to Bharat, I don't know, in Bharat, where they'll give you the facilities, like in, in Indonesia, you know, it's a Muslim nation, you can't even say Allah. You can't have a society with the word Islamic. Islam, Islamic is taboo, it's forbidden. The word Allah, you can't use it. You must say Tuhan, Tuhan, in the language of the Indonesian. This is Pakistan, we don't have to go to that extreme. But I can't see any reason why the Pakistanis can't have universities and schools of their own. Why can't you have your own? That we have to send our children to mission schools, and they are getting brainwashed, getting programmed, even if they are not converted. It's the nature of man, you know, the way they woo us, and they respect us, and they talk to us. They say, no, the Christians are very good people. You know, the hearts are opening out to them. So as soon as somebody comes along and says, you must tell them, Wala takulu salasa, you can't do that. You can't do that, because now it's creating bad feeling. You say, Lakat kafar kalu inna Allah wal ibn Maryam. Anyone who says that Jesus Christ, the son of Mary, is God, is making kufar. It's an act of blasphemy, it's an act of treason against Allah. So, وَقَالَ الْمَسِيحِ But Masih ne kaha, Ya Bani Israel, O Israel ke bachon, La'abudu Allah, Worship Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbukum, Ke jo mera rab hai, Or tumara rab hai. Innahu mu yushish shirik billah, O jo koi Allah ke saath kisi ko sharik karega, Fakad harram ala lil jannah. Can you tell them? No. Why can't you? Because we are obligated. So you put yourself into that position and now we want to know how to fight. Like me, tying your hands and say, come on, fight. Tie your tongue, close your mouth, zip your mouth and say, come on, talk. This is what is happening to us, you see. So it is the powers that be, the people who are in power, they must think and plan and say, look, we must have institutions of our own. Hospital, you can afford it. There are millionaires and billionaires here. Go and approach them, talk to them. In the Father's name, let it be Bawani's university or let it be Adamji's university, whatever it is. Come on, man. What are you doing with those billions sitting on it like a, like a cobra on a pile of wealth? What are you doing with your money? Yeah? No, it's for you, my child. You must talk to your father, your brother. Immediate surroundings. I said, look, what is wrong? Look, we have to go through this because of the education we are getting. But now, why can't we? Why can't we? Talk 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 and inshallah it will reach the, the people in time that they'll do something first chance this is the ladies meeting you have enough of me in the other meetings Very good. Yes, sir, there is a, uh, this is modern trend that uh, this is this modern trend that all the religions teach good things and forbid evils and uh, so the basic thing is that we must have good ikhlaq, good relations with others. So how can we talk about this? How can we say that Islam is different in this sense? And the other question is, ki you've been giving a lot of emphasis on Arabic language, that we must know the Arabic. What about, what about the Arabs who know the Arabic language? It's such, an, such an embarrassing thing to see a sheikh acting like that. And then is it the comp I'm sorry. <laughs> I think one at a time. Let's okay. see. What was the first one? The, all the religions teaching right, the good things. Right. You see, every religion says do good. There's no doubt about that. Not one religion says commit adultery. Not one religion says steal or kill people. Nobody, no, nobody says that. Then how is it that we can say that, look, Islam is the culmination, is the highest point of all religions. It is on the very teachings. You see, each religion was the fittest religion for its time. It was the perfect, it was complete, and yet incomplete. Like our education. You see, in my country, I go up to standard six in certain schools, standard six, what you call eighth year. And then I have to change school. Up to standard six, I get a certificate called primary school certificate. So if I pass that, I am perfect as far as standard six is concerned the eighth grade, I'm perfect and yet I'm imperfect because now still there's a further steps to go. So I go to a high school, we call it a college and in the college I go up to metric. When I pass metric, it's perfect, complete and yet incomplete. Now you see, it's complete up to metric but it's still incomplete. Then I go to university and I take whatever lines that I want to take. Now you see. So at every stage, it's complete and incomplete. It's complete and incomplete. 
So same thing with religion. Allah Bari Ta'ala gave in the system of religions, we talk about Judaism, Christianity and Islam. These are three sister religions. What Allah gave to Hazrat Musa alayhi salam was perfect, complete and incomplete. Then by the time Isa alayhi salam came, he came as a reformer among the Jews. So what Allah gave him was complete for his people, for their needs and yet incomplete. It's only in the dispensation of our Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa that through our Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa Allah gives a final complete revelation and He says in the book, He says, Al yawma akmal tu lakum deenukum This day I have perfected for you for your religion wa atmamtu alaykum na'mati and I have completed my favors unto you wa raditu lakum al-Islam ad and I will that Islam should be your religion. So now it's complete, perfected. Once it's perfected and complete, you can't add anything more. Anything else added to it is an abnormality. Like this hand, look at this, perfect. You can't add another thumb to improve it. You can't add another little finger or ten fingers to improve it. Complete. Anything you now add to this is an abnormality. Same thing to the teachings as given by Allah Bari Ta'ala. is a complete code for all times. But it was not so with Musa, Musa alayhi salam. It was not so with Isa alayhi salam. You see, for their needs, perfect. But it was incomplete. For the times of Jesus, whatever was given was perfect for their needs, but it was incomplete. That's how it is. And what was the second thing? Arabs, uh, oh. they speak the language, but still. Yeah. The Arabs and the Arabs, yeah. Yes, it's, it's, an, it's an anomaly that now look, the Arab is supposed to understand his language. The Arab, that's his language. But he seems to have also lost the spirit behind the Quran. He is also reading for beautification, for sawab. Say, I meet these Arabs. I meet them, I talk to them. And I'm asking them, you see, like in Kuwait, when I went to Kuwait, I saw, as I landed, the man who comes to pick me up from the ministry, sitting with me in the front, I'm asking him, what is your name? So he said, my name is Yusuf. I said, Yusuf? Ah, my younger son is Yusuf and you know you're like a son to me like my son is Yusuf so my companion who had been to Kuwait before he whispers to me that he's a Lebanese Christian I said oh in other words you better change the tune you know he's not what you're thinking I go to the hotel five-star hotel I see the receptionist from his complexion and dial I can make out he's a Hindi man from the subcontinent so I'm asking him where you come from so he said India I said, where about? He said, Bombay. I said, you speak Gujarati? He says, no. I said, that's funny. I come from Bombay and I can speak Gujarati. How is it that you come from Bombay and you can't speak Gujarati? He said, no, I'm a Guanese Christian. I said, oh, name Stephen. I sit down to eat. The waiter comes. Another Hindi. Name Paul. So I asked him, I said, you Paul? He said, yes. I said, robbing Peter to pay Paul, huh? Just a joke, you see. He said, no, my father is Peter. I said, oh, Christian, Christian, Christian. He's eating the cream of the land. When my brothers in Pakistan are hungry for jobs, my brothers in the Sudan, in Egypt are hungry for jobs, in India are hungry for jobs, and the Christian is eating the cream of the land. So, I speak to these people. This is younger generation. I says, you know, when I came, this is what I saw. I said, look, you haven't got the guts. You haven't got the spirit to go and find customers for Islam. You can't go to Bonyo. You can't go to the Amazon. You can't go to China. You can't go to Russia. You know, you're all too soft. You can't move anywhere. So Allah is making things easy for you. He's sending customers to your door, to your homes, looking for jobs. Why don't you talk to them? So the Arab tells me now, nah, it's a lie, Karahafiddin. He's quoting the Quran. Shaitan, quoting the Quran. They said the devil's quoting scripture. He is a Muslim. He is an Arab. He is telling me what the Quran says. He says, La ikraha fi deen. It means there is no compulsion in religion. I said, who's talking about compulsion? I'm not telling you to force Islam down their throats. You, I said, a hundred million, you can't extricate one square inch of land from the mouth of the Jew by force. Am I going to tell you, go and force the Americans to become Muslims, force the Chinese to become Muslims, force the Russians? Who's talking about force? You see? Another guy, I tell him, he said, Lakum deenukum waliya deen. He's quoting the Quran, the shaitan. 
I said, you know, look, this is as a last resort when everything fails. You try. And when that guy says, hey, I'll put a knife through you, then Allah tells you to tell them, When you meet the ignorant one, say, peace. That is as a last resort. If our Nabi started with that, there would have been no problem. If he started with that, we wouldn't have been Muslims today. But you see, he has lost the whole thing. But there's one thing good about the Arab. I'm hammering him. Wallah, I'm hammering him. And I tell you, he loves it. <laughs> this is the beauty of it. He loves it because he knows it's coming from the heart. When I hit him, it's hurting me too. He knows that, look, I'm not trying to score points on him to say, look, you are fools and I'm a clever man. I'm telling him, he says, look, this is what we find ourselves in. And it's about time I say, you woke up and you did something. Allah has given you a second inning. I'm telling them, second inning. And if you don't come right, I says, you'll be destroyed for good. You won't get a third chance. And so I terrify the guy. And but he loves it, you see. But he has also lost touch with the Quran. For a thousand years we didn't propagate, so we lost the art. And once you lose the art of talking, pre preaching, inviting people. Once you lose the art, you don't know how to open your mouth, so you don't open the mouth. As it's about time you learn the techniques, how to start with the people. So this is my field, you see. I mean, in it, I want to share with people how to start with the Jew, how to start with the Christian, how to start with the Hindu, how to talk to the atheist, the agnostic. How to do it? It's so easy. Allah is teaching you in the Quran, but nobody really reads the Quran. That's the saddest part. Nobody really, not even the Molvi. Not even the Alim, the Maulana, he doesn't read it. He's rattling it off. You know, kar jata hai. Khadam kar jata hai. Khadam karte hai sab. But nobody really reads it. And I'm telling the guy, I say, you're not reading it. And somehow, look, I'm not learned it, wallah. You know, I'm a furniture salesman. But you see, what has happened is, somehow, because I'm talking, talking, these people, you know, the Arabs, they called me and gave me a prize, King Faisal Prize. So they, everybody thinks now, I'm some great guy. So now they are prepared to listen to me. Junejo is want to see me tomorrow. Day after tomorrow, Zia wants to see me. <laughs> For what? I don't know. <laughs> a question. Um, my name is Samina Tarek. I'm a medical student. What I wanted to ask is about the word doubt in Quran. Quran says you should not have doubts. But uh, until and unless we don't have doubts, we don't have shak, we can't have yakin. So uh, we have to ponder different aspects of a particular concept or a particular thing to find out what uh, the matter is about and to come to some conclusions. And unless you haven't come to a conclusion, you can't really have um, definite faith on it. You can't have the uh, yakin. So, um, is doubt not right? I mean, to think about a thing, uh, to ponder how, why, is that wrong? That's my question. No, it is not wrong to question. Allah says in the Quran again and again, so this Quran, this verses he recites and says, Allah yatafakkarun. This is for a people who think, people who ponder, people who cogitate upon again and again and asking questions. There's nothing wrong with it. You see, nothing wrong with asking questions. Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam, a prophet of God, Khalilullah, Allah's friend. Allah tells us about him in the Quran. So why is qala? Ibrahim and behold Abraham said Rabbi Arini Rabbi Arini Kaifa Tuhil Mauta So oh my Lord show me how you're gonna give life back to the dead A prophet of God Allah's friend is asking Allah Rabbi Arini Kaifa Tuhil Mauta How are you gonna give life back to the dead? So Allah is asking him why don't you believe? He says, Qalu bala. He says, I do. Walakin litatma qalbi. But for the satisfaction of my heart, I want you to tell me how you're going to give life back to the dead. And Allah appeases him. He gives it to him. In other words, this is his way. He is not like what we think Allah is. He says, hey, you, you don't believe me, I'll put you into hell. No, no. He doesn't say that. He's reasoning with you. He's reasoning with us. If you allow Allah to talk to you. He said, billahi. So how can you not believe in Allah? He's reasoning with you, pleading with you. How can you not believe in Him? 
Vakuntum mamwatan, seeing that you were non-existent, you were dead, you didn't exist. Fa ahyakum, and you brought you into being. Thumma yumitukum, it'll cause you to die. Thumma yuhyikum, it'll bring you back to life again. Thumma ilayhi turja'oon, and to him will be your return. How can you not believe in him? Look, he is not like a tyrant. You know, ready there, looking for excuse to destroy you. No, no, no. He wants you to talk, to think, to reason, to ponder over his creation. Look at it. He wants to do that. But now, when we are asking our learned men some of these questions, this is because they haven't got the answer. The best way is to shut you up. You know, you're going to go to hell. You're going to go to hell. So the best thing is to keep quiet by This is it. But Allah wants you to think. He says that. He wants you to ask. He wants you to ponder. Ask Allah to help and He will help you. Inshallah. This doubts creeping in, nothing wrong with it. Even the Sahabas, they were complaining to our Nabi. He said, you know, when we stand up for Salat, Allahu Akbar, he says, you know, thoughts, doubts start creeping in our minds. What shall we do? He said, you keep on praying. Allah will put it right. You don't say, oh, since now my mind is wandering off, I say, what's the good of praying? No, no, no. You keep on, inshallah, over a period, you'll be better disciplined, it'll come right. But this is the spirit of Allah, Allah and His Quran. Could you just spare another minute? Sir, <laughs> sir unfortunately, there is a, unfortunately, there is a great divide in our women on Parda issue. One says, and I don't know why it is, I mean, it's very clearly written there. Probably when you will say something about Parda, it might sort of have bridged the gap uh, between the two very widely apart section in Muslim women, especially in Pakistan. Could you please comment on something on Parda? You see, that is this working, yes. Uh, the type of Parda, I understand is this Parda that I see before me. My wife, my daughter, this is the type of things that we have. You see, and... There are people who go to extremes, you know, so now, look, I mustn't see anything at all about you all. I said, right. But then what about, I said, this woman from inside that, that, that cloak, she is looking at me. Huh? Is it right? No, she's seeing, she, look, she can feast on me, she's going through me, you know, with her eyes. Is it right? I can't see anything but, but a cloak, you know, right? But she's seeing me. She's seeing every hair of mine in the beard that's standing out and all that, you know, my eyes, my teeth and everything. And she's also, you know, things are going through her mind. I said, shouldn't we, you know, take out their eyes? Women, take their eyes out that they can't see men. <laughs> no, I think it's going a bit too far. I don't know. But I will not as a fatwa tell you anything but to me you all my daughters you are just like my wife and my children at home same type of thing and I don't know I seem to be satisfied I'm satisfied with this so I'm very happy with the rest I don't know let them start debating and questioning I don't know let them fight I'm not a Molvi or an Alim to give fatwa but to me this is acceptable Um, we're really grateful uh, to you for giving us so much knowledge about the Christian faith, but most uh, Westerners get so scandalized if you start talking about religion or politics. What do you think is a safe way to approach them about, you know, uh, religious issues or about their faith? You see, the best way is, as I was telling, find common grounds. Common grounds. And this is what Allah is telling us in the Quran. He says, Qul, tell them, Ya Ahlul Kitab, O people of the book, Jews and Christians, Ta'ala, come. Ila kalimatin sawa im bainana wa bainakum. That we come to common terms as between us and you. Let us get onto a common platform. You start from a common base. And Allah tells you what you should talk about. Number one, about Allah, Allah na abuda illallah, wala nu shirika bihi shay, and so on. But, this principle of finding common ground is such a beautiful system that the person is, happy, is cooperating with you. Common ground, start from common base. 
I said, even with the atheist, you know, person who don't believe in God, we say he's a kafir. I don't know what you say in Urdu for an atheist. Atheist, don't who doesn't believe in God. What do you say in Urdu? Dehriya. A guy is an atheist, he said, there's no God. Now, that he is supposed to be the greatest enemy. He is supposed to be the greatest enemy of deen. The man has said, there is no God. Look, the Jews say there is God, the Christians say there is God, the Hindus say there is God. Here is a person, Dahriya, he said, there is no God. And I am telling you, find common grounds with him also. Anybody. This is a beautiful principle. Allah says with the Jew and Christian, but it can be extended to anybody, everybody. Common grounds. So how do you find common grounds with the atheist? One who doesn't believe in Allah. How can you be have anything in common? I said, look, if you know his background, very easy. You see, I come across Westerners. Westerners. I asked them, what church you belong to? This is also very innocent. What church? Because among the Christians in South Africa, among the whites, there are 1,000 different churches and denominations. Among the Af blacks, there are 3,000 different sects and denominations. So, among of Christians. And they're always asking one another, what church you belong to? What church you belong to? Are you a Jehovah's Witness? Are you a Seventh-day Adventist? Are you a Mennonite? Are you a Christadelphian? Are you a Roman Catholic? Are you a... They're asking, what church? What church? What church? So I ask, what church you belong to? The guy says, no, I don't go to church. I don't believe in God. So I said, congratulations to you. Mubarak badi to me. He's shocked. When he says, I don't believe in God, he expects me to, you know, start attacking him now. I says, no. I said, congratulations to you. He said, what for? I said, you see, if you told me you are a Christian, no congratulations. Because your father was a Christian, your mother was a Christian. You tell me you are a Muslim. I said, no congratulations. Because your father was a Muslim, your mother was a, was a Muslim. No, what did you do? You inherited it. What have you done? Nothing. So no congratulations. But if you say you are an atheist, I said, congratulations. Because... Your father was a Christian, your mother was a Christian. You come from a Christian environment and you say you don't believe in God? You have been thinking. So I congratulate you for that. What made you say that there is no God? If your father was a Christian, they were going to church, mother was going to church, and now you say you don't go to church and you, you don't believe in God? You were thinking. So for that I congratulate you. Your mind has been working. Christian, he didn't work his brain, his Jew didn't work his brain, the Hindu didn't work his brain, the born Muslim didn't work his brains. You worked your brains. Congratulations. I said, you see, you have been thinking. What have you been thinking? I said, look, the things that you have been hearing about. You have been hearing about creation. I said, yes. Even he's an atheist, he knows what he has been reading as a child in the Bible. The whole environment is telling him about creation. He said, you see, you read in the Bible that God created Adam and Eve. He said, yes. And he put them in the garden. He said, yes. And he told them, eat anything, everything. Except the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden. I'm reading from the Bible. That tree thou shalt not eat. That fruit thou shalt not eat. Because the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Says the Bible. That day, you'll surely die. So shaitan comes along and he tells them, he says, look, that fruit is very good to eat. And if you eat, you shall not surely die. So they were tempted. They act. And they live for 950 years after that. So now you are confused. God said that day you shall surely die. Shaitan said thou shall not surely die. And they didn't die. Who's speaking the truth? Shaitan. So they act. As soon as they act, they realize that they were naked. Prior to that, maybe grown up people, but they were innocent, masoom, in the thinking. They didn't know that they were naked. Now they realize that they were naked. So they started plucking leaves. I'm reading from the Bible. I'm reading telling his background, I'm telling. So they started plucking leaves. And Adam heard, the Bible says, God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and Adam heard his footsteps. 
like a mighty giant, like King Kong, or bigger than King Kong. And the earth is shaking. Boom, boom, boom. So, that's what the Bible says. Adam heard the footsteps of God walking in the garden in late afternoon, cool of the day. So he goes and hides himself in the bushes with Mahawa. So God comes and stands. I'm only reading what is in his book, what his experience I'm telling him. So God comes and stands where Adam and Eve were a few seconds before. And he scans, he looks, he can't see them. So he says, Adam, Adam, where art thou? Tu kaha hai? Poor God, he doesn't know where Adam and Eve are. <laughs> or maybe, maybe he's playing hide and seek. You know, with, with, with Adam and Eve, like I do with my grandson. You see, I have a grandson about three and a half years old. So I go home, ah, and he's very happy to see his grandpa. But I go pretending that I don't see him. So I shout, say, Rais, Rais, tu kache. Where are you? I, that's my Gujarati language. You see, he understands my language. And I'm looking all over, Rais, where are you? <laughs> and he's laughing, he's laughing. He's like, Grandpa can't see me. <laughs> so maybe the Almighty also was wanting to have a little fun, you know, so playing hide and seek. I don't know, see, but that's what the Bible says. So Adam peeps through the bushes. You're sheepishly guilty. So what's wrong? Why are you hiding? He said, because I was naked. He said, how do you know that you were naked? You have been eating the fruit. So he says, no, it's the woman that that gave us to me. She made me to eat. In other words, he's blaming Allah for giving him that woman. He said, if you didn't give me this woman, I wouldn't be in trouble. He <laughs> said, you gave me this woman. <laughs> and he says, you woman? You woman? He said, no, it's the serpent that beguiled me. Satan ne hame, wo saap ne hame puslaya. So, you know, the cowards, our grandfather and grandmother, first, they're cowards, you see, passing the buck, the responsibility, somebody else, somebody else, the oldest game in the world, still with us today. However. So, I said, you believe in a God who walked in the garden and Adam heard his footsteps? He says, no. I said, me too, I don't believe in a God like that. Then in the book of Genesis, there's still the same book, first book. Hazrat Musa alayhi salam wants to see Allah. So he wants to see God. In the Quran, Allah says, Lan tarani, you shall never see me. In the Bible, he says, look, I must see you. What to do? So Allah bari ta'ala, he relents. He says, alright, I'll do you a favor. So he puts him between two rocks, the Bible says. And he puts his hand in the opening. So Musa alayhi salam can't see him. Then he turns his back. God, he turns his back. And he takes away his hand. And Moses sees the back of God. He saw his backside. Allah's backside he saw. I said, do you believe in a God like that? That somebody can, Moses can see his backside? He says, no. Maybe the front side was too horrible to see. <laughs> <laughs> he saw his backside. So I said, me too. I don't believe in a God like that. Me too. I said, you know, you say, the Christian, your father, mother, the whole Christian world, they said, Mary, the mother of Jesus, carried Mary, Mary she carried Jesus for nine months. Who is this Jesus? He's God. He's God who came down to earth as a man. He was born like any other human child, circumcised on the eighth day. You all know what is circumcision. Khatna ki uski, atme din. God, somebody holding God and getting him circumcised. You believe in that? He says, no. That a woman carries God for nine months, you believe in that? He says, no. I said, me too, I don't believe in it. Can you see? So, I said, look, this man, this atheist has taken the first right step in the direction of Islam. He is nearer to us than the Jew, the Christian or the Hindu. Because he has uttered the first words, La ilaha. There are no ilaha. There is no ilaha. I said, Jesus is not ilaha. Rama is not ilaha. Krishna is not ilaha. So he is saying, La ilaha. I said, now take him to illallah. Look, he's taken the first step. What do you start with? Anybody who wants to become a Muslim, what do you say? Say, say La. What is La? No. Ilaha, koi ilaha nahi, koi maabud nahi. There is not, nobody worthy of worship except Allah. So he's taken the first step. He said, La ilaha. Now look, find ways of making him to see that there is illallah. So look, common grounds and you know, common bases. Wallah, you can do it to anybody. If you want to sell, our fathers are business people. And you know when they sell rubbish, how they sell, I know. We have been selling. I'm a salesman originally. So selling, selling, selling. And I know how to sell. 
उसको कैसा फुसलाते हैं यू नो अब दिल्ली वाला ब्रदर्स यू नो दे वेरी गुड इन बंदर रोड यू नो दैट ओल्ड बंदर रोड गुड गुड स्वीट माशा मास्टर्स मास्टर्स क्या जुबान उनकी शीरीन है कैसा हम फुसलाते हैं यू वॉन्ट टू सेव योर रविश यू यूज सच आर्ट एंड टेक्निक वाई नॉट इन द वे ऑफ अल्लाह ऑल्सो Think you can develop. Allah, you can develop, and it's so easy, and so pleasant, and it's so you know it gives you such satisfaction because Allah says, "Li yuz hiro hu ala din kulli." I mean, asa din dia hai is a master who can supersede them all, bulldoze them all. And when you have the power of a bulldozer, have you seen bulldozer at work? Yes, I just watch and watch and watch for hours. Just see how it moves, you know, heaps and heaps, moving mountains. How it does, flattening the ground. You just stand and look. <laughs> the way it's working, you get fascinated, mesmerized by what it is doing. You are that bulldozer. We can bulldoze any ism, whether it be Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Christianism, atheism, every ism. Islam is destined to master them all. It's a privilege Allah has given us as a strength and common ground.